Aquaponics Components The general considerations when we are planning our aquaponics facility are that the materials we use should ideally be durable, non-decomposable and non-toxic. And obviously this is so that the water quality is not affected by deteriorating products and also so that our system is durable and lasts. Also give very careful planning to the elevations so that the siphons and the flows between the various components will all function properly. The gravel beds and tanks should all be level. That doesn't mean they need to be on the same level, but each individual tank and bed needs to be level. And then also depending on the system you're using, ensure that you have the correct ratios between the components. We will now discuss the various components in turn. First of all, let's talk about the fish tank. Ideally, one would use a plastic or fiberglass tank. The reason for this is that both of these products are very durable and also inert, so they're not going to affect the water quality, which as you'll see later on when we discuss water quality, is extremely important in an aquaponics system. Dark internal walls help the fish feel secure but the floor of the tank should be light in color, white or a pale color, so that it is possible to manage the fish population when one looks vertically down into the tank. This does not affect the fish in terms of them feeling insecure. A water depth of between 0.7 and 1.2 meters is ideal. There's no benefit in going deeper than this. If the tank needs to be shallower than 0.7 meters, particularly if the water is clear, it is ideal to shade the tank so that the fish feels secure. Grow beds are ideally made of fiberglass because it is very strong, it is durable, it is light and it is portable. Also, one could consider using wood covered with fiberglass or covered with plastic, but this is less durable. Whichever material you use, make sure that the sides of the tanks are strong to avoid bowing. The depth of the gravel bed should be 0.3 meters and the width a maximum of 0.7 meters is as far as an adult person can stretch. So the width, if it's up against a wall or the side of the tank or the side of the tunnel, can't be more than 0.7 meters or if you're able to access from either side the grow beds can be 1.4 meters maximum width. If you are using the gravel bed technique or flood and drain technique then an auto siphon is one option for draining and refilling these beds. This enables us to have the flood and drain cycle that causes your aggregate bed technique to work so well. Bear in mind the drain pipe must be able to handle the full water volume flow in less than 5 minutes. The auto siphon pipe needs to be double the diameter of the drain pipe and the gravel guard double the diameter of the auto siphon pipe. If you have a look in your course manuals you'll see this explained in detail. Also then we have castling along the base of the auto siphon pipe to allow water to flow in at the bottom of this pipe only and holes along the lower end of the gravel guard enable water to flow through the gravel guard from the bottom of the tank again to limit the chances of any channeling forming within the beds. In the ideal world the cycle time should be somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. It is however acceptable to have a cycle time of as long as 30 minutes. In this series of diagrams you can see that the water is pumped continuously from the fish tank to the gravel bed, causing the gravel bed to rise. Inside the bell siphon the water level also rises but the outflow pipe, the upstand pipe, has no water in it until the height of the water in the gravel bed exceeds the height of the water in the upstand pipe and then overflows the top of the upstand pipe, taking the air with it that was trapped below the bell siphon and forming a siphon. 
The water then siphons out of the gravel bed through the outlet pipe until the water level drops so low that air sucks in at the bottom of the castling around the base of the bell siphon. At this point the siphon breaks. The process starts once again because the pump is continuously pumping water into the gravel bed. If you are using rafts, then once again fiberglass or wood covered by plastic are ideal tanks to use for the raft. Strong sides are essential to avoid bowing and a water depth of 20 to 30 centimeters is ideal. According to the width of our polystyrene sheets, the width of the raft tank is typically in the region of 1.2 to 1.5 meters. The polystyrene sheets themselves should ideally be in the range of 25 to 30 millimeters thick. Whatever kind of pump you choose to use, make sure it is continuous rated. In other words, it is designed to run continuously. Not all pumps are designed to run continuously. If you choose to go for a centrifugal pump, this will be very durable and less expensive than a submersible pump. But submersible pumps have the advantage that they are very simple to operate and they require no priming. The flow capacity of the pump needs to be double the total grow bed volume, that is the empty grow bed volume, per hour. So if your grow bed holds 100 liters of water, your pump needs to have a capacity of at least 200 liters of water per hour. We generally overspec the size of pumps such that the extra flow can be used to aerate the fish tank. In a large system, you may choose to have a dedicated aeration system by means of a blower. Blowers are a life support equipment and therefore one should not compromise on quality. Buy the best that your money can afford. Diffusers are a means of breaking up the bubbles into many small or medium sized bubbles and in this way providing efficient aeration and stirring of the water within the fish tank. Aeration is placed inside all fish tanks unless you are farming an air breathing species of fish such as catfish and in the raft beds below the polystyrene sheets. The important thing here is that we need to maintain the dissolved oxygen level above 5 mg per litre at all times. The aggregate used in the grow bed needs to be inert. Generally, we prefer 20 mm stone. The ideal stone would be from a source that is absolutely neutral in terms of chemistry and does not give off any alkalinity or hardness into the water. The advantages of stone include that it is very durable, it's inexpensive and it provides a counterbalance for the weight of the plants as they grow so that the plants don't easily fall over. Aquagrate or other forms of clay pebbles between 12 and 20 mm diameter are also very useful and often preferred to gravel. I personally do not prefer them. There are numerous advantages and disadvantages associated with this. Your clay pebbles are inert, so they don't affect the water quality. And they are very gentle to work with, so that they don't damage nails and fingers when you are digging in the bed. However, they are hideously expensive. And furthermore, they tend to float until saturated. Which means that for the first week or two, one has to put a weight on top of them or very gradually flood the bed whilst the clay pebbles are absorbing water. Failure to do this means that every time your bed's flood, the clay pebbles will simply fall out of the top of the bed. Another problem with the clay pebbles is that they tend to come in a range of sizes and the smaller ones will go through the system and get caught in your pumps and if you're using non-return valves they will not function properly and the pumps themselves can get blocked up and not function properly either. I personally won't have Aquagrate in any of my systems. The sump, depending on the design, you may or may not choose to use a sump. I personally use the fish tank as the sump. 
The purpose of the sump is to place the pump. In other words, this is the lowest point in the system from which the pump draws the water before pumping it back to the highest point in the system. It needs to be large enough to hold all the water during the level changes. If all your gravel beds flood and drain simultaneously, the sump needs to be large enough to handle that variation. In terms of plumbing, bulkhead fittings, or otherwise known as threaded nipples, or barrel nipples, are commonly used, as are grommets. Make sure whatever plumbing you do, that especially on the inlet side to the pump, there must not be any risk of an air leak, because this can cause gas bubble disease. Within the grow beds, you'll notice that there are zones. Zone 1 is the dry zone. This is above the area that is flooded during the flooding cycle. The water must never come in contact with the light in the gravel beds because we don't want algae growing on the stones. Zone 2 is the flood and drain zone. This is the area that during the low tide is exposed and during high tide is flooded. This is the area where most bacterial and root activity will take place. And zone 3 is the mineralization zone. The depth of this zone is unique to your system, but it's generally in the region of naught to about 3 centimeters. This is the zone where solids will collect and mineralize and release nutrients back into the water supply for the plants. The floor needs to be covered with some sort of a structure to prevent plant growth. Also, water will spill on the floor from time to time, and we don't want mud. And by having some sort of a structure on the floor, we prevent mud from forming. Also, basic hygiene dictates that we want to have a clean environment. We personally use a heavy-duty gardening cloth covered with 12 mm stone. But equally, one can use concrete. Concrete is, however, rather expensive. The entire aquaponic system should be housed inside a greenhouse tunnel. This provides bright light for the plants. If you are fortunate enough to be in a tropical or subtropical climate, you may be able to do it outside. But certainly within a temperate environment, you will need to house your aquaponics facility within a protective housing. This protects from winter cold and also during the summer months enables us to trap the warmth at night so that we get optimal growth throughout the year. During the day and summertime the tunnel may generate excess heat which can then be vented by opening doors or ventilation on either end of the tunnel. Greenhouse tunnels are very widely used for this purpose but glass houses can also be used in cool temperate climates. Outdoors is possible even in a temperate environment but this certainly limits the range of crops and fish that one can use. In very cold climates, one can even do aquaponics indoors using metal, halide or other lights. When it comes to energy, solar is a very expensive form of energy, especially if batteries are used. More recently, there are options to tie your solar panels into the national grid, but this has not yet been fully commercialized. Wind is also expensive and once again batteries are required. Hydropower appears to be the most cost effective according to the industry experts. Whatever kind of aquaponic system you have, it is essential to have a reliable backup power supply, preferably one that comes on automatically when the power fails. It is adequate to back up just the pumps, but ideally one wants to back up the blower as well. When assembling your aquaponic system, start by deciding on the design. Are you going to go for an aggregate bed technique or flood and drain system? Are you going to go for deep water culture? Or will you choose a nutrient film technique option? Or possibly go for a combination? Whatever type you go for, the plant crops that you grow will direct your decision, and this has to be the starting point. 
In terms of basic designs, the first option, as originally started by uh, Paula and Tom Spiranio from the United States, is based on a double pump system. The grow beds are elevated above ground level, and the water overflowing from the grow beds collects into a small sump. A pump with a float switch pumps the water from that sump back to the main tank. The fish tank has its own pump, which then pumps water on a cycle, typically for about two or three minutes, into the grow beds. Then the pump is off for about ten minutes. During the two or three minutes, the pump pumps sufficient water to flood the beds. During the ten minute part of the cycle, the grow beds then again drain. This system has numerous disadvantages. It is very simple, but you've got two pumps instead of only one with more modern designs. Also, the switching on and off the pump to create the flood and drain cycle does mean you don't need a bell siphon. But the regular switching on and off of the, of the pump's motor is, creates a lot of wear and tear on the mechanical parts of the pump. The next option is a constant height one pump system. Here, the fish tank is at a semi constant height. The water overflows from the fish tank into the grow bed. The grow bed has a bell siphon which drains into a sump tank, and the pump with a float switch is housed in the sump tank. When the sump tank fills with water, the pump switches on and returns the water directly back to the fish tank. The next option is the single pump in the fish tank option, which is the system that I prefer as it is the simplest of the options. The water is pumped from the fish tank to the grow beds, and from the grow beds, the bell siphon causes the water to overflow back to the fish tanks. Very simple. There are a host of different assembly options that one can follow with aquaponics, from a whole range of home based systems to this system which is largely constructed out of wood, which is the growing power system as made famous by Will Allen from Milwaukee. On the left hand side you can see two plastic half barrels growing a crop and this is a system made famous by Travis Huey known as Barrel Ponics. And on the right hand side you can see a larger scale version of this being used by Joel Malcolmson from Australia. There are many, many options when it comes to aquaponics components. We've just touched on a few, and I trust this will stimulate your imagination to scratch further and make some decisions for yourself in terms of how you want to structure your aquaponics system. Be sure to stick to the biological principles, and I'm sure that you will have lots of fun.